Hey everyone, Anthony Fantano here, Internet's Busiest Music Nerd. Hope you are doing well. Uh, we are here today with author and uh, musician as well, I believe, Aaron Carnes, who has come through with a, a new book titled In Defense of Ska, a genre that I know a lot of you in my comments, thanks to some recent reviews and discussions, has uh, kind of been at the point of a lot of uh, conversation. And uh, I think this is a pretty apt time to release such a book, especially with uh, records like the new Jeff Rosenstock just out and that kind of getting the rave reviews that it has. And uh, Aaron, with this new book, has put together an impressive assembly of bits of history of the genre, of various opinions uh, about the genre and, uh, you know, its, its formation, its fall from grace in a way and where it can kind of go from here. And I was hoping to address that and anything else that comes up in this conversation uh, with him today. Sure. Thanks for having thanks me. Thanks for coming on. through, man. Yeah, um, it's a it's a it's a it's great timing for this book, but it's a complete coincidence because I've been working on it since 2013. Wow. So uh, it was just my luck that Jeff Rosenstock released an album, a Scott album, two weeks before my book mm. came out. Uh, so, so couldn't ask for a better uh, <laughs> couldn't ask for a better time to release a Scott. Book. So considering. Um how much in a way, I, I guess, the, the narrative and the conversation and the curiosity around the genre has shifted in 2013. Uh, I, I don't purely yeah. want to, you know, view this conversation through a 2021 kind of lens. Uh, what inspired sure. you to sort of start on this journey so many years ago? You know, what was kind of the impetus for the inspiration then? Well, um, I think the big thing for me was that I became a music journalist in 2009. Okay. And I think the longer I was doing that, I was becoming more and more aware of how my peers absolutely did not take this genre seriously mm. at all. And that it seemed like every other genre had like these, you know, in-depth books that went into the, the niches and the little scenes and, and really trying to drew out all these kind of obscure yeah, I, don't, I don't know if there's any ska in like the 33 and the third series. I, I, I haven't seen any ska records. In the there is a couple. Are there? Okay, ones, cool. But you know, we're talking post two tone. Absolutely yeah. not. And so, you know, two-tone is still remembered pretty fondly because it was so popular in England. And of course, Jamaican ska is, is uh, definitely, you know, a lot of people like Jamaican ska. But I think a lot of people think of ska after two-tone as sort of this period of time that doesn't need to be talked about or remembered. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that my, my inspiration was as a, as, a fan of, as a fan of ska, as a former musician, and as a journalist, I wanted to highlight this genre and say, like, hey, this music is great and uh there's way more to it than this the little bit of time it had in the mainstream in the 90s mm. uh, and it's not just that it, it started in jamaica and it had this two-tone period in england post two-tone it's been a it's just a vibrant period of time all throughout the u.s and it has traveled all over the world and done so many interesting things and yet it's just crickets when it comes to ska mm. in terms of like i guess the the, the critical reception and the historical deep dives yeah, I, I think in terms of those things, and then I think it trickles into the sort of the fans, and, and the fans kind of stay quiet. It's that's definitely changed now. The fans, are, the fans are much louder mm -hmm. now. But for a long time, I think it would be like if you were a Scott fan, you know, you would stay within your bubble, and you maybe kind of had a self depreciating attitude about it with your friends. Like, yeah, I know I like Scott. That's you know, like it's like a guilty pleasure almost. Uh, wait, Whereas I feel like it's not. It doesn't have to be a guilty pleasure. It's good where, music. where did you, uh, uh, you know. Where were your formative years as kind of like a music, as a musician and a music fan? So I grew up in Northern California and I graduated high school in 93. Mm -hmm. So 92, just before I graduated, I discovered the band Skink and Pickle. Mm -hmm. And that was like, I went from zero to a hundred that night. You know, I didn't really have a proper understanding of what ska was at the style of music or anything. And a friend recommended I check them out and I went and I was just, I was blown away by the music. I was blown away by their live performance, which was extremely theatrical and just engaging. I really liked the energy. I, I, I liked the, I liked that, like that high energy, but I didn't really connect with angry music as a teenager. Mm. So, you know, but this was like not angry music. And uh, I loved the, the welcoming atmosphere that there was like just all kinds of different people there. You know, like a lot of the Scott jokes nowadays is like, People who make fun of ska in the 90s act like it was just crowds of rooms of dorky kids and fedoras, but that's not at all what it was like. It was like every kind of kid was there. It was like metalheads were there. There was like hippie kids, goth kids. There was like a few rude boys. There was just 
nerds, weirdos, they were all kind of together in this space and it was extremely welcoming, inviting. It didn't feel like you had to be a certain way to be there. It just felt comfortable. And, um, you know, the moshes, the, the skanking moshes were extremely friendly. It was a different environment than a lot of the alternative music scenes that I had kind of started dabbling in at that time. You know, I, I loved Primus um, before I heard of Ska and I would go see them live and I would feel mildly terrified at the audience even though I love the band so much, you know, they were just like uh, antagonizing the band, like throwing things at them, saying, Prime sucks, you suck. I mean, that was part yeah, of the That was their meme. Like little, yeah, it was a little intimidating as like a, you know, a kid who grew up in the small town, like just getting into like music at the club level. So, and, and I loved, I loved that the music could be kind of goofy, but also be serious. Like Skank and Pickle was just like this kind of crazy show, but then they would have these like, serious songs that were like, you know, racism is bad. And they would just sing these anti-racist songs, you know, I really connected to the whole thing. And I just went deep in the genre after that. Yeah. I mean, in, in some ways, as you say, like ideal, uh, ideologically, it's almost like we're, we're rife for a Scott comeback because the whole genre and everything that it stands for in terms of like, um, you know, just looking at the two tone scene and all of the racial solidarity that came out of that, it just kind of like makes sense for 2021. But, um, yeah, I think that a lot of the young kids and the the younger generation that are getting into ska are super in tune with that, and uh, in a way that maybe the mainstream '90s sort of slipped away from a little bit to some degree. But, even though I feel like the DIY '90s scene was pretty pretty in touch with that. Before, um, before I go into kind of one of the, the some of the personal experiences to kind of bounce off of yours, sure. Um, I, I wanted to ask you, like, sort of in relation to that maybe tone deafness that that you're talking about, or maybe things kind of slipping away in that way. Do you feel like that's kind of reflected in what was it like that recent Mighty Mighty Boss Tone song and music video that dropped where it was kind of like in reference to George Floyd and everything like that? And there mm -hmm. seemed to be like a real split among hardcore fans that were like, yeah, this is cool. This is like, you know, great message, da, 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 da. And then you had younger fans and, you know, younger music listeners, some of whom weren't really, you know, familiar with the band or all that into Scott to begin with. They're like, you know, this, this isn't really it, you know, is, is there something like messaging wise or culturally that's kind of split between these two generations of music listeners and Scott fans that you think needs to kind of be overcome? Well, I think with the boss tones, uh, that was definitely a, to a tone deaf song video mm -hmm. package um but the boston's historically have been i th i would say one of the bands that were definitely had anti racist oh, no, most definitely anti -racist yeah. message so i would say historically they've been on point and i totally respect and love the boston's to me it feels like a well intended miss um that i just don't think they fully thought it out i don't think they really thought about um how the images might have went with the song and the, how and how people really felt about George Floyd and everything. Um, so, and I think that the the younger generation are so like in tune with this stuff and are so like wanting ska to be seen in a, in a way that reflects the social justice values that they have. So I think they were a little bit like, why are you guys doing this? And why is this getting so much attention? We're putting out like a very positive, you know, progressive message. So I think there was a little bit of a reaction there because of that. Yeah. I think maybe what they and some of the older fans weren't necessarily intending. And, and this is, I think a difficult growing pain of kind of continuing to exist as an artist into the social media age and, you know, uh, trying to evolve creatively and, and tailor your message in, you know, an era of black lives matter and, you know, so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, you know, maybe this is a message and the way it was portrayed that would have worked in the nineties when you had kind of like yeah. a media landscape where there was just like a, a complete lack of like, you know, POC voices to kind of say these things and point these things out where, mm -hmm. you know, it might make sense for a band of, you know, kind of cut from their cloth to kind of stand up and make that statement. But at this point, it, you know, it's, 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 I guess, kind of a balancing act for an artist. And I've seen, you know, some artists who are younger and well-intentioned kind of fall into the same trap where, you know, they're trying to say something, they want to point something out and they want to make a statement, but it ends up coming across in a way where it's like, you're speaking for somebody, you know, it's, and, and, and I yeah. think we're still kind of trying to find a balance between speaking to an issue and speaking to a problem that needs to be highlighted, but doing it in a way where you're not kind of like replacing the perspective of somebody else who's directly affected by that problem. Sure. I mean, I've never, I've not spoken with the Boston's about that. <laughs> I don't know what their thoughts were. Um, they are a mis mixed race band yeah. too. So they, they have multiple voices within their band. I don't know the dynamic within mm -hmm. the band. Uh, to me, it just seemed 
it just didn't seem like they really fully thought it out before they released it. That's just my perspective because I know those guys are great guys and those guys have, you know, they've have songs in their past that are very explicitly anti-racist and they're, they've been on the right side of history. So, um, they took the video down. I think it was the right call. I don't, they didn't really make a statement about it, but I think it was the right call. Just say, you know, you know, let's, let's, let's get that out of here. Um, so, and I think that the way that some of the people outside of the Scott scene piled on them, I think got a little extreme mm. because they don't know the history they of that don't. band and they don't know where they're yeah. coming from. To me, I felt like it was like, you know, somebody who has the, you know, like I said, well-intentioned, but really just, you know, it was a bit, it was a miss for sure. Um, but kind of bouncing off some of the personal stuff you were saying earlier, uh, I'll say up in New England and specifically Connecticut, I mean, musically and artistically, we're not really known for much outside of like metalcore, you know, <laughs> like uh <-huh. laughs> we've had a huge metalcore scene over here for years. And obviously bands like hate breed are a huge deal. And when I was in high school, uh, you know, we'd be going to VFW shows and there'd be a lot of just metalcore bands, metalcore bands everywhere, metalcore bands like left and right. But, um, even though we didn't have like a lot of <clears throat> like specifically CT homegrown, uh, ska bands, uh, you know, our ska scene wasn't quite like that. Th there did seem to be quite a strong audience for it. There was even like a, a pretty huge, one of the biggest music forums of the two thousands in, in my state was ctska.com and they'd be, and they'd be oh, okay. listing shows there like every week, every weekend. And some of those shows I'd been to were like some of the most fun shows ever. Um, sometimes they were the largest shows. Sometimes they found themselves to be in the most interesting venues and places. I mean, you know, the metalcore shows were great, but usually they'd be limited to pretty small and sometimes obscure venues because of just like the really aggressive moshing that would happen at all of them. And, you know, you'd have a lot of uh, mm -hmm. bookers and people are kind of managing these spaces, like concerned if someone gets hurt, is there going to be a lawsuit, this, that, and the other thing. And at the ska shows, it was like pretty safe that that wasn't going to be the case. I mean, I think one of the last <laughs> ska shows I went to in the 2000s was actually at a chicken spot. Uh, it was like this restaurant that <laughs> had been sort of closed down for the day so that it could be rented out mid afternoon to like host like three or four ska bands. And it was a mid, a again, it was a mid afternoon set. It was totally nuts and it was a great time. But, um, but, yeah. uh, uh, yeah, like the shows were great. The scene was great. It was so beloved over here, at least in this area, they were even, um, to my recollection, uh, some beloved local, metalcore acts that even incorporated the sound into their style. There was this great band called Folly. Uh, that, oh, yeah. Uh, Folly okay, yeah, awesome. yeah. They, they, yeah. Like, they had amazing breakdowns and like they would transition so fluidly into like, you know, those like upstroke guitars and everything. And like the crowd would go nuts. The crowd would go insane. Um, yeah, we, we, cl we claim Folly in the Scott Absolutely. As, as one of the Scott Absolutely. Band. Fucking yeah. Lily. So, um, yeah. But yeah, you know, at, at, at least in my experience, and maybe this is something I kind of lost track of as I was kind of transitioning into college and internships and, and all that stuff. But, you know, I, I don't necessarily like recall there being like this intense uh, kind of turn of face and like hatred for the genre, or, like, you know, people getting made fun of for being into the genre, at least in my area, you know what I mean? So, uh, you know, that, that did kind of make me curious as to like, why did it die out? Why did it not get taken seriously? Why did it not continue to yeah. progress? Um, so, you know, I was hoping that, uh, uh, you can kind of shed some light on that because there does sort of seem to be that period of time, like in the mid to late two thousands where, things are kind of like losing steam and why exactly do you think that kind of happened? Well, I think ska, it's weird. It's a weird thing because it got overhyped in the mid nineties mm. to where it was made to be seen as something bigger than mm. it was. And then it's downfall got overhyped that it made to seem like it was a bigger plummet than it actually mm. was. So if you look at it more on the ground level, you know, I think that you got some attention and some new people coming to the genre. And then you have some people leaving the genre when it's no longer mainstream, but you continue to have a pretty healthy fan base after it's outside of the mainstream. Mm -hmm. um, like the band mustard plug um, in, in the early 2000s, 2003, 2004. I mean, they, they did a, a ska is dead tour. That's what they called the tour. They called ska is dead. It was, they were commenting on this concept, but they were, showing that Scott wasn't dead. So they like kind of rounded up all the bands that were still like touring 
and they put together this tour package. They played pretty big rooms and everyone was like, you know, everyone outside of the ska scene was like, how are all these, how are these ska bands playing, you know, rooms this size? So it was like a deliberate, like, like see, ska isn't dead, but we're, you know, we're kind of having a little fun with your perception sure. of it. Um, and then when it, when you get to like ska, that's like less punk ska, that's more in line with like, uh, you know, bands like the Slackers, they're not like traditional ska, but it's more like rock and roll, soul ska. Those band, that kind of, that band, they kind of got bigger in the 2000s. Hmm. You know, they put out Wasted Days in the early 2000s. That was probably the biggest album. They're featured on NPR. They just were touring machines and, you know, their fan base really didn't connect to like this sort of the, the, the 90s pop ska, I mean, sorry, punk ska mm. trend. They kind of saw themselves as a whole different thing. And the band kind of feels that way too. But the way they were impacted was dealing with bookers and dealing with people that would say like, yeah, we're a ska band. And the bookers would be like, oh, that's a dead genre. And they would have to say, no, it's not a dead genre. And we have a plenty of fans that are going to come out. Mm. So you kind of see a consistent fan base, particularly in that style of ska. And then you see the, the punk ska kind of comes and goes in the 2000s. Um, I think in the South, like in Florida and uh, New Orleans, you see a pretty healthy punk ska scene in the mid to late 2000s. Um, in the, in, you know, about a decade ago, you start seeing bands form like We Are The Union, Kill Lincoln. Mm. And those bands, you know, they're still doing, they're still out there. They're doing great right now. They're kind of hitting even more fan base. But that's when they started was in those sort of dead years. So I think it's, it's, it's a weird thing. It's kind of hard to really quantify that like ska, on one hand, ska sort of like was overhyped and it was a trend and then it went away. But on the other hand, it was like, wasn't the case. It was like continued on. And so now what you have is like, it's in, it, ska's getting attention again. And then you have this like weird conversation where it's like, ska, ska didn't come back you know, it didn't leave, but at the same time, you are seeing all this new energy for it. So there is something happening that's unique to this year that, you know, wasn't true like two or three years mm -hmm. ago. Yeah. And, and over this course of, I guess, what you could perceive as like a dead period, um, you had incredibly popular artists like Vampire Weekend, for example, like incorporating the genre oh, heavily yeah. into their stuff. And it, it was it was just so ironic to almost like see, at least in terms of critical reception, the genre at like a low point while one of the most like praised bands out there is just like casually just like throwing ska licks into their stuff. I love, I love vampire weekend because the, the media would call them Caribbean. Influence right, right. Right. And any, in the, anything like to not song, say the did, word ska. Yeah. They wouldn't say the word ska, but there's a couple songs in there that are so overtly ska. And here's a funny story. Um, Mike Park, um, from Asian man records, he said he claims that um, you know the singer of that band Ezra, yeah, is that his yeah, name? Ezra. had um, like had emailed him in the '90s and said that he drew uh, skank and pickles on his uh, school <laughs> desk. Stuff. So obviously he was a '90s uh -huh. band. So you know to, to sort of talk about that peak of popularity and you know the way ska almost like kind of fell from grace in a way past the overhype. Um, you know, you mm -hmm. referenced, uh, you know, we are, we are the union a bit ago. I've, I've had some interactions with, uh, you know, a ska to network, um, uh, mm -hmm. on, you know, about, about this exact topic. So, you know, shout out to, uh, to them. Um, but, uh, I, I guess my question to you, and, and not that I disagree with the idea that like, you know, do, do we want ska to go mainstream again? I, I guess it's something, you know, to be wary of considering the way things have kind of changed and sure. shifted. But we, we, over, we oversee a lot of genres that at one point have kind of like an underground grassroots scene and then kind of come to that prominence, but then kind of coast down a little bit more mildly. Like, you know, sure, we, we could say that this happened to ska, but like in comparison to, you know, from your knowledge, like, why does that same like aggressive crash and burn not happen to emo, you know, for example, which mm -hmm. in my opinion, like, uh, look, not that I think that the peak of ska creatively or mainstream wise was like super cringe or awful or whatever. But I mean, it's like, God, that like there are way more worse mainstream emo records than I can name like mainstream ska records. Like I can name dozens of trash, yeah. like absolute garbage emo records. And, and look, there's a lot of, there's a lot of great <laughs> underground emo that I like, you know, and, and still to this day, yeah. like really fuck with, and there are some great modern bands as well. But like when it comes to a genre reaching a certain mainstream peak, 
like emo's was way rougher than ska's like are you kidding me but emo is still like still really happy and healthy to this day and meanwhile ska's like fucking struggling to like get a you know get a leg in and get a review on like you know a, a major site so you know i i guess from your perspective like why does that same i guess like you know, lack of, uh, I, I guess, legitimacy or, uh, you know, uh, critics not wanting to take a certain genre seriously, not happen to emo, but it happens to ska. I think that something about ska really, the fact that it has a joyful quality to it, the fact that it's horn driven, you know, I think people don't want to be happy. Rub, it just, it is the antithesis of cool. I think, you know, I think you, you can make a case <laughs> that, you know, even bad emo has a, has a vein of cool mm. to it. But ska is just, and I think the way it was presented in the mainstream, really, not even necessarily the specific bands, because I agree with you, there's great mainstream ska albums, and I pretty much respect and have like a, you know, positive opinions about most of those bands, um, because they're doing their own thing. And I kind of felt like ska in the early 90s was bands were all doing their own thing. And we all, all of them existed doing their own thing in, in a very healthy way, like, you could do like kind of goofy ska, you can do like kind of serious punk ska, political ska, you know, but the mainstream, you know, of course that's what happens, like plucks out a few bands and then it sort of rewrites the narrative and says, you know, ska is this goofy Orange County mm -hmm. music and, uh, you know, all the kids are singing about silly stuff and they're just dancing around. And of course, like, that's not really true or, you know, it's, it's, it's partially true. And so the people who only understand ska on that element, they get extremely embarrassed mm -hmm. by it. And it's like they want to like disassociate that they were never this goofy, nerdy kid. Um, like when um, on my podcast, In Defense of Ska, we brought Jeff Rosenstock on. And um, he told me that I, one of the parts that like I just kind of resonates with me, it just really cracks me up is that he said that in 2016, when he started became a critical darling with worry, like every outlet they had to ask him about the one song on there that was ska and it was only like a minute and a half rainbow right and they all like asked him about it like it was this real big deal like why'd you you know what's up with the ska song like, as, it, it as if like he, he wasn't bomb the music industry yeah yeah as if it was like a gimmick and he got so like weirded out by hearing this question over and over again he like asked tom brehan from stereo guns like what's the deal and tom's like we all grew up, we all grew up loving ska and then we discovered Radiohead. <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> That's unfortunate. I mean, uh, look, I'm, I'm not going to say that I've, I've listened to, uh, uh, ska's dedicatedly as, as I should have, you know, since I was originally like introduced to it through the punk scene. But, uh, uh it, thankfully it was not Radiohead that I jumped off the ska bandwagon for it was not, uh, <laughs> That's that's probably the last band that I would that I would trade in my uh my 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 checkered my checkered belt in for, um as, uh -huh. as good as Radiohead is, <laughs> I think they I think they could coexist, um, so uh, uh I I wanted to kind of get into you know the almost like the waves discussion not too deep into it but sure um you know Skaz is, is sort of seen in this handful of different waves uh being you know obviously that Jamaican first wave based a lot in that Trojan record scene where you have fantastic artists like Prince Buster and so on and so forth you know classic well Trojan is like a Trojan comes later oh, okay, that's okay. an English thing oh, got it. Um, you're looking at 50s Jamaica yeah. Jamaica music is where ska starts yeah, yeah. well i mean you know those There's, artists those artists originate from a, there no the right like from the like prince buster originates sort of from the fifth yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. you got the right artist but it, trojan it. was an english thing that came later and so what, so what, la what so label what labels were there on the ground floor there at the time that were sort of like you know uh, putting I, things out there uh, i'm sorry I, you're, i'm i can't remember oh, off the top okay. of my head um but you know they were mostly it was mostly a singles oriented yeah. thing back in just like just like rock and roll was or yeah, yeah. And um, a lot of the times the music was played at sound systems, mm -hmm. you know, that was where, you know, all the music kind of, it, it started out like they got they were really into like American R&B and they would get all the the best R&B tracks and play them. And then eventually the, they started getting local bands to do ska songs, mm -hmm. you know, which would, was really a lot of them, a lot of them would play a lot of these same songs, but put their own sort of spin on it, which was like, you know, kind of flipping the beat around and adding, adding these other elements to it. And it, that's sort of, the genre came out more or less, you know, that, that's extremely oversimplified. Um, no, it's, but, a, it's a very quick version. Yeah. <laughs> but, but it is important to put out uh, there. There was, there was a lot of, there was a lot of immigration to England and that's where, you know, two-tone comes as a result of that because 
ska, ska and rocksteady and reggae and all this music comes with it. And a lot of these, these immigrants live in communities where they kind of keep their culture intact. So, and then you also have like the working class white kids who are hearing it and are getting into it. That's where you have like the late sixties skinheads who were originally just like fans of this music and culture. So two tone becomes because that's just been around and it's there. And you know, there, you have like a combination of like these punk rockers, these mods, these immigrants, or some of them are children of immigrants and they're reviving these old ska records and combining it with the, the punk and the roots reggae uh, that's popular in the late seventies. So you get this fusion music. That's what two tone mm -hmm. is. It's like, it's not pure ska. In fact, a lot of the songs that they covered are like old rock steady songs, old reggae songs, but like punkified, you know, and um, it, it's an interesting thing. It's such, such a vibrant style of music because it's, there aren't a lot of rules about what they did. And if you look at the bands, they're doing, they're all doing their own thing and they're all moving away from ska pretty quickly. They're all mixing in other genres. I mean, the specials on their second album, they start taking all this Muzak stuff um you know if you look at the beat their second and third album it's like less and less ska but it's all really good so um, the waves i think the waves get into a, a murky area after two-tone I, I like to think of jamaican ska as ska two-tone as sort of the beginning of ska revival because it is not real pure jamaican ska it's a it's a version where jamaican ska is an influence and other elements come into play um we think of third wave as this nineties thing, but really ska came to the U S this, you know, as soon as the two tone bands got out to the U S you know, from their records, from the bands touring, from the documentary film dance mm -hmm. craze, it spawned a lot of interest in the underground scene in the U S right away. All the major cities had ska bands. The LA had the untouchables who were amazing bands, huge in the, in the early to mid eighties, uh, the toasters, started in the early 80s in New York. Bim Scala Bim, they were the, the original Boston ska band. They predate the Bostones. Mm -hmm. um, Uptones in uh, Northern California. So this is a slow build and a healthy underground scene for 15 years before la major labels get an interest. Mm -hmm. So before labels even get interest, you know, there's all these underground labels. There's Moon Records. There's first Dill Records, then Asian Man Records, you know. Um, jump up records in Chicago. There's zines, there's bands are touring. Uh, some of these bands are making a living, you know, scraping by as underground artists. So the Scott scene is super healthy, super vibrant. So the fact that it's framed as a trend is weird because it had been a thing for decades before that with a ton of fans. So I think that's where it kind of gets like, uh, I, that's where I kind of like come in and, and want to like say, like, I don't think that we should talk about ska and waves because it really paints, it doesn't create an accurate picture of what really happened. You had to like, a, you know, you, you think of punk rock, punk rock was in the underground landscape all through the eighties, mm -hmm. you know, seventies, eighties, and then, you know, Green Day and Offspring and these bands got really popular. And then, you know, uh, there was a lot of punk underground bands and then there continue to be punk underground bands. We don't think of those as waves. We think of it as, you know, there's decades of this music going in different directions and it was mainstream for a bit. And then it wasn't, you know, I mean, Scott wasn't really that different. And that's why it's, you know, it's continued on, you know, the last two decades in some form. And now it's, you know, now people are giving some of these bands more attention than they were. And some of these bands that, you know, like we are the union have been around for 12 years or mm -hmm. whatever. So. No, I mean, I, I'm glad that you kind of dissected it and pulled it apart in that way because uh, I, I think I think the waves kind of needed some demystifying um, because yeah. you know it's. Well, that's what we have in common with uh, yeah. emo. Emo gets also defined in waves for some. It reason. does. It does get defined in waves. <laughs> and I'm sure they probably feel a similar like it's not waves. Yeah. But been, you yeah. know, I, I, the but but I, I guess part of what makes the waves thing sort of make less sense when you you know, look closely at, or you look at it kind of in the context of how we're existing right now, as opposed to a historical way, uh, you think about like, what does the fourth wave of ska even look like? Because, you know, when you're yeah. there, like on the grounds, you know, seeing bands like we are the union continuing to this day and doing their thing. Um, it makes you realize how slow and incremental the evolution of all of this is. Mm -hmm. There's not a point at which, 
uh, there's like a super huge breaking point where everybody just starts sounding a certain way, you know, like this stuff yeah. d develops then, slowly in time. It's incremental. Everything's nuanced when you're actually on the ground because, uh, you know, you sort of cite the nineties being a certain way and having a certain type of popularity. But one of my favorite bands from that era is choking victim, you know, which like, sure, uh, you yeah. know, sounded totally unlike so many other bands during that era had no horns in any of their stuff. No horns. Like, totally wild, very aggressively anti-cop yes, songs. Very, yeah. very, very a cab <laughs> all the way. Well, I mean, you know, I was, I was very into a lot of radical politics at that time too. The, the first time I'd ever heard Michael Parenti's voice was, uh, on their, you know, on their no gods, no managers record. And, uh, I was just like totally taken who, who is this nasally rambling guy who was just like making these excellent points about just like, you know, capitalism and so on and so forth. Um, you know, on this record. And I had to like, look that up because they were, you know, the way they were kind of incorporating him into their music. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it, you know, it's funny. Uh, I'll give you a funny side mm. story. I interviewed Scott for mm. the book and um, he was coming. I live in Sacramento. He uh, they leftover. I'm sorry. Yeah. Leftover crack. were playing yeah, here. For, for anybody who doesn't know, leftover crack is sort of the band that rose out of the ashes of, yeah. of choking victim. Yeah. Choking victim didn't last very long. Um, they, they also, um, they had already decided that they were going to break up while they were recording the album, but did not tell <laughs> Tim Armstrong. But that was the case. But um, anyways, Scott, Leftover Crack came through Sacramento. I met up with him beforehand. Uh, we went and got some food at his request. We went to this grocery store that has like buffet mm -hmm. style. And we were kind of starting the mm -hmm. interview. And uh, he, well, while, while he was grabbing food, we, we, we left. He uh, it doesn't pay. He looks at me and says, I know this isn't ska. And this kind of shrugged his shoulders. And we continued on. <laughs> <laughs> it's not ska. It's true not ska. What in true of ethos? Like yeah, stealing so, food. I guess that's not his. Sorry, size. guy. That's not very ska of you. To <laughs> 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 I, I think I think that's probably a good way to check each other amongst friends. Sorry, man. That wasn't very ska of you. Right now, please try to be more ska in the future. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but yeah, you know, like that wild, grimy anarchist sort of sound that, that they brought to the table and, and obviously ethos, um, you know, it was certainly a, an anomaly in the scene at that time. And, uh, you know, sort of, uh, uh, mm -hmm. just kind of adds to the, the, the narrative that it was a lot more diverse than some people are maybe kind of willing to, to give it credit for. Sure. Yeah. I mean, there was other bands too. I mean, like I think Link mm -hmm. 80 is a great East Bay punk mm -hmm. band, punk ska band that did a very like grimy punk thing that don't get as quite as much credit as people should be mm -hmm. giving them. Yeah. And, and everybody, you know, loves, uh, uh, even more aggressive, like, you know, punk driven bands like op Ivy. Um, and you know, everyone oh, yeah. remembers streetlight manifesto. I mean, you mentioned them in your book as sort of almost like the, 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 the one ska band, some of those like writer types will admit to liking or admit to, you know, sort of uh -huh. like being able to praise because th there are so many like epic and grandiose and kind of conceptual elements to their music. It, it doesn't matter if kind of the horns are in there and, and everything. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I guess they're sort of like every music writer's dirty little secret or whatever. Um, but I mean, I kind of back to your point, like you think about what we call third wave. I mean, toasters were considered third wave because they were around and they were popular in the nineties, right. but they started in like 81 mm. and, you know, real big fish started in like the early nineties mm. and they're called third mm. wave. And those two bands don't sound anything yeah. alike. Um, Hepcat was like a more soul traditional ska band. They started in like 1990, I think, um, you know, we, we call them third wave, but they're nothing like those other two bands. And, uh, I well, guess we would probably call Choking Victim Third Wave because that album came out in 1999 and nothing like the three bands I just mentioned. So I think like it also it's it's simplistic in terms of foregoing the different subgenres of ska that were around at that time. And they continue to definitely. Be around. Yeah. I mean, as you say, sort of like putting everything in waves kind of ignores the various sub styles, because when we talk about punk, we don't talk about punk merely in waves. We're talking about punk and post-punk and noise punk and dance punk. And, you know, we have all sorts of different yeah, exactly. punk sub genres. Um, but that, you know, ska is not treated in the same way. And as you were just kind of like poking holes in the narrative, when we're thinking about it merely in terms of waves, and we're especially thinking about the recent stuff that's most apparent to us because it's in our minds and we experienced it, like you have to start thinking, yeah. are we labeling this stuff as third wave? Because 
they're incorporating punk into their music or it sounds a certain way? Are we calling it third wave because it existed during a certain time? And as you just sort of cited, you have examples of people who are sort of outside of that timeline. You have artists who are still, you know, around today who are staying pretty pure to the two-tone form or, you know, something that we would even perceive Mm -hmm. to be pre, you know, ska punk. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Um, I think like, you know, like the, the big thing for me, and I, I wrote a book defending ska a little bit to have fun with it, not like as a super serious thing. I, but I think like, I just want people to give ska a, a chance, whether it's to just treat it a little more like another genre. Like I feel like most genres are treated with a little bit more respect than ska. And I was just, the only thing I was really after with writing a book this way was just to say like, hey, you know, Ska isn't just some, you know, subgenre for these this group of people over here that everyone should forget about. I mean, it should sit alongside um, all the other subgenres of music that we, you know, whether you like them or not, you know, whether you like country or don't like country, you know, it's still a, a genre that you respect. And maybe you like Johnny Cash, but you hate Nashville country pop, but you don't say country. I hate country or why, why are we even bothering with country? I mean, we go like Johnny Cash, he's genius or Willie Nelson, genius. And, uh, Oh, a Stur- uh, Sturgill Simpson. Okay. He's, he's doing, he's doing genius stuff right now. So we don't go country sucks. You know, even if some, you know, a lot of this mainstream Nashville countries does mm-hmm. suck. So I'm just kind of saying that we should, uh, maybe reevaluate all of our biases about sky and just let's, uh, let's, Let's let it exist on, in the landscape of genres uh, alongside the other ones. Well, uh, listen, Aaron, you've been a, a great guest. Um, thank you for coming on and kind of laying out the history, um, you know, demystifying the, uh, uh, the waves, as it were, you know, illustrating important things like ska comes before reggae, which for some reason people are still confused about to this day. I don't know why, <laughs> but they're confused about it. Um, I think people are confused about it because two-tone came at the tail end of roots Mm. reggae. So they think of like, Oh, okay. So reggae, you know, Bob Marley, those early Bob Marley records predated two tone, Mm. but you know, early, early Bob Marley records were ska. Mm. So you just, you know, you need to, people just don't know that stuff. Well, uh, for anybody watching, uh, still at this point, we're going to link down to the book below on YouTube. So, you know, you guys can, uh, uh, get a hold of the book for yourselves and read into everything and all of Aaron's insights. But before you go, uh, I, I have to, uh, put you through the ringer quickly and very okay. fast in no particular order. Just, just for, we've got a lot of younger people watching who may not be that familiar with the genre and are, I'm sure are interested in hearing the history, but, uh, you know, want a really direct route to go to after this conversation. Can you throw out in no particular order, like a top 10 ska bands? Like what, like what are the okay. bands people have to come away from this conversation checking out if they want to be familiar with the genre, enjoy themselves, the cream of the crop and get an understanding of it. Okay. Let's see. We'll, we'll throw out Scottalites. You got to listen Classic. to Scottalites for old stuff. Yeah. Their stuff. And they also backed a lot mm-hmm. of bands. Um, I'm going to, so I'm going to throw Desmond Decker out there too. Uh, although a lot of his really great stuff is more in the mm-hmm. reggae period. Um, Two tone. Let's go selector and the specials. Those are, I think neck and neck. The specials are more known. I think the selector are a little bit underrated. Great band. They kind of mix the Jamaican and the punk elements in a, in a, in an equal balance, I think better than most bands mm-hmm. did. Um, got to do, uh, fishbone early, like eighties fishbone is, is pretty ska and some of the best stuff that's out there, particularly their first EP self-titled. Then you got to throw in op Ivy, of course. I think those two bands fundamentally changed ska post two tone. Um, so let's see for 90 ska. Um, I love Hepcat, uh, MU three thirty is one of my favorite kind of underrated ska punk bands from the nineties. Um, let's see, uh, another, let me throw another nineties band in there. Okay. Skank and Pickle were my favorite band back in the day, but I'm going to recommend in terms of record to check out Mike Park's band, the Chinkies, because I think those are, those records have really held mm-hmm. up. Well, that's a band he put after that's, a, that's a band he put together after he left Skank and Pickle, all Asian American band, uh, a couple great records. And then after, like, he also did some stuff with Bruce Lee band. It's, it's still Mike. The Bruce Lee band stuff's mm-hmm. great too. I, th- I, 
And then I think yeah, that's I think nine. We have room for one more. And then let's go for a modern one. Just say bad operation. That's like a that's the cream of the crop of the new bands. Although there's a lot of great new bands, but bad operation is a great place to start if you're looking for contemporary mm -hmm. ska. I, I haven't even heard them yet, so I'm gonna have to look them up. They're in a more of a, like a two tone vibe, but a little grittier. Okay. And you know their own thing. Uh, they're from New Orleans. Great stuff. Okay. Well, hey, thank you for the recommendations and uh, everyone watching. Check out the book. Check out the recommendations that Aaron just made. And uh, we thank you for coming through. And we appreciate your time. Thank you.